Hi, this is John Southhurst reporting for CoinGeek at London Blockchain Conference. And I just heard a very excellent presentation from Dr. Owen Bourne of Enchain. Owen, oh, first of all, I heard you recently got married, so congratulations. Thank you. And uh, I believe that that is actually relevant to what you announced. Yeah, so I have a personal motivation for a, a problem that I'm trying to solve in this talk, which is cross-border payments. Yeah. So I got married a couple of uh, months ago in Argentina, where my wife's from, and that involved a lot of payments. We both live and work in the UK, so we had to send money to Argentina to pay for the wedding. But um, the problem with Argentina is it has hyperinflation. So 11% in the month of March when we got married, 300% over the last 12 months. And they have currency controls because of that. So it's a very difficult country to do business in. The UK banks just won't send money there. There's too much risk. Yeah. And also third party providers like TransferWise, they don't operate in Argentina. So the way we solve this is to send cryptocurrency and in particular USDC, which is a, a US backed uh, US dollar backed stable coin on Tether issued by Coinbase. Um, and one day, one of my vendors said, well, we didn't receive your payment. And I checked and I, I had sent it, um, but I had to look a bit further and I realized I didn't send them USDC. I'd accidentally bought and sent something called USDBC, which is also a US dollar backed stable coin issued by Coinbase. So, you know, luckily I could convince these guys that, look, I'm an expert in blockchain. If you, I can help you extract your private key. I can create a wallet with a new platform so that I could send my own money back to me. And that was a good deal of stress. And it, it also cost me money in transaction fees as well. And it really got me thinking, why does this exist? Why does USDBC exist? Who does this serve? It's a really terrible user experience. Yeah. And that's what we hope to uh, not have in the future. Well, I can see myself uh, making that same error because I'd, I'd never heard of USDBC before. Mm. I, I'm familiar with USDC. I think it's Circle that uh, issues that. Yeah. Uh, but there are others with uh, many similar names too. And, and they have the same the same asset on different chains, which yes. are not always compatible with each other. Yeah, and you have a liquidity issue right there yeah. because we have US dollar, I think is the most popular stable coin, has all different types of US dollar backed token on different chains that are not compatible with one another. This is a ridiculous situation. It is. The, the, a company should be able to issue a US dollar backed token that's usable on any blockchain. And I'm pleased to say that's what we can now do using yes. our new uh, protocol, which we've called Universal Blockchain Assets. I think uh, when you announce this, it hasn't really sunk in yet. Mm. But this, this is a big announcement. Uh, this, we, we're all familiar with ordinals, yep. ERC-20 tokens. Mm -hmm. This could be bigger than those. We suddenly have a way of issuing or using the blockchain with much less risk much less cost and to a much wider market. So I think one of the reasons it hasn't quite sunk in is how simple the protocol is. Yeah. We don't require a trusted third party. We don't require a bridge. Yeah. But in its simplicity masks a lot of complex thinking. Mm -hmm. But I'm really confident that once people learn about this, they check how it works, they're going to realize, yeah, it's a simple protocol, but there's a lot of power behind that. And I'm really interested to see what people do with it. Now, you've called this the Universal Blockchain Asset or yes. UBA. Yeah. And this is a completely new kind of thing. Yeah. This does not exist in any form. Any no, course. it's a new type of asset class. Mm. And the name's descriptive. It's universal to any blockchain. Um, if you follow this protocol, you can issue your token on one blockchain and allow your users to transfer it to any blockchain they like or within the same blockchain if they prefer. So how about this? You uh, transfer this token to a blockchain that has much lower fees and then I can start using it for small casual payments. And then maybe I move it back onto another blockchain that's a better for store of value or something like that. 
it's a really universal protocol. So we're, we're taking the problem that there are too many blockchains. As yeah. you said, there's over a thousand of them now. Yeah. That's separate blockchains, not just tokens on blockchains, yeah. but actual blockchains. There are over a thousand. That, and I think uh, they all have their varying degrees of speed and congestion and fees. Mm -hmm. if, uh, if we were to create assets that could be transferred across chains, um, that, that could uh, also serve the purpose of helping people discover which blockchain is actually the most efficient. Absolutely. Well, now, if we think about it, we're no longer locked into any blockchain. Exactly. So the blockchains are going to have to compete yes. for the business of these tokens. And we're going to maybe see users preferring some blockchains over another when this friction is removed. So I think it's going to be a, a really interesting time to see what blockchains win out. Indeed, and my favorite blockchain like. is Bitcoin SV. I think it wins on uh, high transaction volume, low fees, and data and scripting capabilities. But now we'll see that play out. Okay, so uh, just to sort of briefly step us through the process of how do you, how do you create a UBA uh -huh. and what does it do? What is it actually doing? Yes, so the way we approach token issuance and transfer in our universal blockchain asset protocol is to introduce a new medium of transfer, which we call a packet. And we're very specifically not calling that a transaction because it's not a blockchain transaction. Yes. It's a packet that authorizes the transfer of ownership. A packet has inputs and outputs. In the inputs, you see who is the previous owner and you have a signature from the previous owner authorizing the transfer. And in the outputs, you have a public key of the new owner, and crucially, a reference to an unspent blockchain output on the recipient's favorite blockchain. Now, this out point is used when the recipient spends the token further. When they spend it by creating a new packet, that packet is committed to by spending a transaction on their blockchain, because blockchain transactions that are unspent can only have one final state. Once they're spent, they're locked and any data that is associated with them is fixed. And that's really the heart of how the double spend protection works in this protocol. Okay, so I understand that if I'm, if I'm creating a UBA, yep. then I would understand which blockchain I'm creating it on and uh, which yep. one I might be sending it to. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to, uh, to transfer a UBA between two parties who are completely unaware of what it is and how it works? The complexity can be masked under the hood. Yep. So we're talking about blockchain transactions. The, the token owners don't actually have to care about the blockchain at all. They could have a wallet that is managing the blockchain transactions on their behalf. This is because blockchain, um, the native blockchain token, so Bitcoin in Bitcoin or Ether in Ethereum, in our protocol, they're only used for transaction fees. So I just consume them when I write data to the chain. They're never sent between the two parties. So it's a, this can very easily be managed by a wallet service that has a, very, that has a lower security requirement than the packets themselves, because packets really authorize the transfer. The blockchain transactions just record a commitment. And if, if those blockchain keys are ever compromised, the worst that can happen is my transfer is not confirmed. They can't steal my token or reallocate it. So it has quite strong security properties when dealing with the blockchain. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you well, what happens if something goes wrong, but it sounds like you've thought of that already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I, okay, hypothetically, if I was sending a, uh, a UBA from say Solana to Ethereum, mm -hmm. uh, where are my paying fees? Uh, if, uh, so you, are, you own the token and you use Solana and the recipient uses what was it? Uh, Ethereum. Ethereum. Then when you send the token, you pay a fee on Solana to record a commitment of that token. So the sender pays the fees. Okay, right. So the sender will pay for the fees on both chains. No, on their chain. On their chain. So only. you only ever use Solana. You don't have anything to do with Ethereum. You don't need to know what it is or how it works. You only use uh, Sol the native currency of Solana for transaction fees to record some data on the chain. Right. So yes, I, I would have to have a certain stash of the original. Uh... Yeah, yeah. But that's all you need. 
your fate, you just have to deal with the native token on your favorite chain, never anything else. What happens if I transfer it to a different chain and then it gets stuck because uh, the, uh, the recipient doesn't have any fees to send it on? Is it well, I, I, not that's not problem? your concern anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so the, um, the, the blockchain of the recipient whatever restrictions or features are present on that blockchain, they will have to deal with. So perhaps they have to wait an hour for a confirmation. That's the that's the um, concern of the recipient, not of you. Right. I think people who are hearing this for the first time, they're just gonna look at it and say, uh, yeah, I already know what bridges are. Mm. And uh, that's been around for a long time. So yeah. what you're doing is not a bridge. Absolutely not. It's not a bridge. I would say it's the opposite of a bridge. So and can you tell us how does a bridge work? Yeah, a bridge really works like this. Say I use one blockchain and you use another, and I want to send my asset to you. I have to introduce another platform, which might be a blockchain in its own right, which we call a bridge. And I first move my asset onto the bridge, and then from the bridge onto your blockchain. But I really don't like bridges because we're trying to solve the problem of having two blockchains mm. by introducing a third blockchain. That doesn't make any sense. When you look into the details of how bridges work, they're extremely complex. They use words like locking assets, swapping assets and burning assets. And whenever we hear these things, we should be very nervous. Anything that relies on burning an asset, I think it's fundamentally not the right approach. Yeah. So bridges exist and they, they work in a sense that we can achieve this, but at great cost, at great complexity and a lack of security. The biggest hacks in cryptocurrency history have happened on bridges. I see, yeah, and I, I understand the problem with that. It, um, it, it's kind of sorcery in a way because it's, you're not really transferring the asset from one chain to no. another. You're just, you're, you're faking it. Yeah, it's more like you're burning it on yeah. one uh, platform and creating it a copy on another platform. That's how a bridge works. Yeah, it's like teleportation. If like uh, the original is actually being destroyed and then yeah. you appear, but it's not really you. Well, I, I don't know if you've ever seen a film called The Prestige, but it yeah. works exactly like that. He, he doesn't invent a teleportation device. It's a cloning device and a version of himself has to die every time the teleportation is done. That's absolutely terrifying. Yes. All right, well, uh, UBA is definitely not as uh, terrifying as that. Do you have a, do you have a patent for this? Yes, we do. We have a patent pending for, for the uh, idea behind UBA. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say we really, this is why I'm here presenting it. We want everyone to use it. You know, you don't need Enchain to implement this. It's not like it's a, a, a product or an API that you have to sign up on. You can implement this right away. And its value is in the fact that it's interoperable, that we can all use it on different blockchains. If someone wants to do this, uh, who should they contact? Contact me contact any of my colleagues at Enchain. Uh, we would, we're gonna go out of our way to help you get that set up for a reasonable, um, reasonable fee. So if you are a developer just starting out, there'll be no cost. But if you are a big enterprise and you're making money off of this, yeah, we're gonna look into the appropriate royalty fee. But our goal is, is to make this as easy as possible. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I hope that a year from now, we're back here talking about different kinds of UBA wallets that people are using. Mm. But uh, otherwise, I think that's a fantastic announcement. And I honestly, I just can't wait for it to sink in. Yeah. For Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to announce this to the world. And I'm really excited to see what everyone's going to do with it. All right. Thank you very much, Owen. Thank you. This is John Southurst reporting for CoinGeek at London Blockchain Conference 2024. <laughs>
But what exactly is it? Learn the basics from experts. Learn what Bitcoin is, how it works, and why it matters. Blockchain 101, your ultimate guide to the fundamentals of blockchain.